Greetings, Bio 100 team. It's exciting to be here with you. I thank you in advance for your attention and for being patient as I learn this new format of bringing you information and content. In fact, I'm actually sitting at home with my awesome dog, Mojo. Yes, that's his name. And he's a schnoodle, which is a schnauzer mixed with a poodle. A schnoodle. I'm not making that up either. He's just delightful. And he's at my feet now. And if he barks during the video, well, so be it. And you know, you might be consuming this content at the beach, in a library, at home, while driving home from work, through the car speaker. All those are acceptable. And so no matter how you are processing this, thank you for being here. My name is Rob Crawford. I'm one of the faculty members here in the biology department. Since this is my first video in the series for the whole course, I just wanted to let you know how excited I am to be doing this. First of all, we get to work with a great team of students and the faculty who are doing this are all really dedicated to, in this context, bringing you relevant tools that will help you apply science, hopefully in the real world, and at least in some small part, get ahead of this. This meaning the feeling you might have one day when you've got your degree in hand and you go out there and get that first job or you go to graduate school and you, you think to yourself, wait, why didn't I learn this in my classes? I wish I had learned this application of this thing in biology from my courses. I felt that a lot um, when I started to uh, go out into the workforce and one of my first jobs was a, a lab technician and uh, the first thing they had me do was prepare solutions and we're going to talk about that. Um, and with that came a fear of having to do math. I, I remember being so scared. And I'm going to let you in on a, a little secret here. I don't care what level of science you might be at, whether it's entry level from a bachelor's or even a seasoned professor, math isn't easy, math isn't fun. And I understand that there's a, a trepidation that might come with it and, and a little bit of stress and angst. And so we're going to try to break that down for you so that you don't feel as overwhelmed by it. Uh, practice makes perfect. And the great thing is that out there in the job force, you always can check your math, whether that's online or with your coworkers. And so we're not going to have an exam on this necessarily. And therefore, you should feel free to do the same. Use this as an opportunity to build your skill set, but you don't have to do so in a silo. I'm here for you. The fellow instructors are here for, for you throughout this course, um, and so will your classmates. And so use your resources, and uh, we'll be here for you. As you can see by looking at the title, here we are, 3.1, Lab Calculations and Overview. Stock buffers, dilutions, and working solutions. And if you say those three things really fast, stock buffers, dilutions, and working solutions, oh my, it makes you think of the Wizard of Oz, perhaps? I don't know. It did me, at least. You know, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Sorry. Uh, I'll keep those terrible jokes to a bare minimum. I, I do promise. In a moment ago, what you see written before you represents some fundamental skills that are often asked to be employed in the workforce um, and in your classes. And so going forward, after you take Bio 100, you might use these both at the lab bench in a class and then in your jobs. And uh, we hope that to be the case, and we hope to really, really help prepare you for those things. And I, again, I know I just said this, but I'll say it again. Um, I want you to breathe. I want you to take a deep breath, okay, as we go through this math and go through the setup. I know math can be extremely uh, stressful and, and scary, and so we're going to try to make uh, uh, this as um, pain-free as possible for you and give you strategies that will make you feel better about it. In fact, I'll give you one right off the bat. I like to listen to Daft Punk while <laughs> performing calculations. And, and yes, I, I, I said that. Um, it just puts me in a good zone to do the math. 
and it makes me feel less stressful. Um, so whatever your trick is, do it. And in fact, you know, I would be playing some Daft Punk through the speaker right now for you. If I wasn't so worried about being sued, I just don't know how this all works. And until I figure that out, we're going to have to hold the Daft Punk. But you can play it all you want at home. Having said that, what are we going to learn? What do we hope to get out of this? What are some of the objectives that uh, we fellow instructors hope you come out with uh, following the watching and, uh, of this module and some of the uh, uh, interactive questions that come? Well, let's just start from the top. How about a quick review of the metric unit conversions, meaning the multiplication factors? How do we go from a liter to a milliliter? What, what is the distance between them, mathematically speaking? What about that microliter, that nanoliter? We're going to start there, and hopefully this comes as um, a bit of review. But if this is the first time you've seen it, that's all right, too. Our goal is to get everybody on the same page, no matter where you're coming from in your coursework. The second thing we would really like to do um, is to help you learn how to prepare stock buffers very, very commonly done in labs. Um, in fact, when you walk into a lab, you're going to see them. Maybe there's a saline solution, um, and maybe there's some liquid media to grow bacteria. And often, these are prepared using specific molarities or percent solutions, say, for example, a 40% weight by volume. And so we're going to do that, and we're going to help you learn how to calculate those things. And then we're going to do uh, dilutions to create working solutions from those lab stocks. And so the goal here is if you're making a lab stock at a higher concentration, but your experiment demands that you use it at a lower concentration, how do you actually do that math to perform that dilution? Buffers, dilutions, and solutions. Oh my, indeed. So let's keep going. Ounces, cups, pints, these are common amounts for measurements that you're going to find at home when you're following a recipe, making some sort of delicious dish for dinner. Mmm, getting hungry right now just thinking about it. And you know, when you're in the lab and you prepare solutions, you have recipes to follow, and that's a good thing. You can consult the lab's binder and follow that recipe to your heart's content. You don't have to have it committed to memorizing something. It's going to be there for you, okay? But the measurements that you see are not going to be the ones that we just listed for cooking at home. We're going to use things based on the metric system. And so it is really good idea right now to kind of dust off the old memory a little bit, get some cobwebs out of our head, shake it all out, and remember some basic rules for working with the metric system. And when it comes to scaling, I want to keep it pretty simple for you. And so this is by no means a comprehensive chart. This is by no means a comprehensive list. But we've kind of tried to streamline this for you um, into a handy dandy conversion chart for things that you're going to find uh, more common in the lab. And if you're already feeling a little bit of stress, a little bit of worry, that's okay. Pause, talk to your friends, talk to us, come on in and visit those office hours. The great thing about science and the great thing about the way we're teaching this class is it is, as I've said, a collaborative exercise. You're not in the lab on your own. In fact, even to this day, when I have to calculate anything, I run by my students, I run it by my colleagues, and I, and I triple check my math. Uh, with those around me to make sure it looks good. Sometimes I forget these rules too. So let's let's start out and we're gonna jam from one liter or one gram. Okay? Let's just keep it right there. So let's say we were scaling on a metric level away from one liter designated typically as lowercase L or one gram typically designated by lowercase G. I'm gonna give you three columns here. A prefix a symbol, and a metric distance away. And again, we're going away from a liter or a gram. Okay, So here are the three most commonly used designations, and particularly as you're working in molecular laboratories Okay, on this kind of scale. We're going to start with milli. And you've heard of milli before. Um, if you put milli in front of liter, you have milliliter. 
The symbol is lowercase m, and so milliliter becomes ml for milliliter. It would be mg for milligram, and I think you've worked with these designations before in your lab classes. The metric distance away is 1 times 10 to the third, or 1,000. Another way to think about that is 1 and then add three zeros, or 1 and move the decimal place to the right three spaces away from 1. 1 1.0 becomes 1,000 as you move that decimal place three to the right. Why would I go to the right? Well, because my exponent is a positive number, so I have three there. One, and then add three zeros, make it a bigger number, make it a thousand. If that was a negative three, well, I would move my decimal point three spaces to the left. If it was one times 10 to the negative three, that would be 0 0.001. But that's not what we're doing just yet. We're going to come back to that concept, but I just wanted to make sure we were okay with exponents and powers of 10, this being three powers of 10, or three decimal places to the right, three zeros to the right, away from one. Pause this, do a little bit of math on a piece of paper, crank up that daft punk or whatever music you like to listen to while you're doing this, and convince yourself you got that. Okay, take your time. I hope you paused it. I hope you're back. I hope you talk a little time to think about that before we move forward to our next most common designation, and that's micro. I'm a microbiologist. I love microbiology. I love bacteria. The bacteria are the bee's knees. Uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. That's really embarrassing. Old man talk here. Um, and actually, it's even more embarrassing because this has nothing to do with microbiology. Micro is a designation we use in the metric system, and we use it very commonly. The symbol is that fancy little U there with the thing on the left, up and down, a little vertical line. We call this mu, okay, so mu is that fancy U, little fancy symbol there. Um, and in Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, you can insert symbol and find mu there. Um, if you put it together, you get microliter, so mu l or you can get microgram amounts and that would be mu g the distance away is one times ten to the sixth and again that's a positive six so our exponent is telling us hey this is six powers of ten let's move that decimal place to the right six times let's add six zeros we are away from one liter or one gram by one million times you might want one million dollars. But that would require you to know what movie reference I'm talking about, and I'm not sure you do, because I watch lame movies, although I consider this one to be pretty good. Okay, so one times 10 to the sixth. Nano is another common one, designated by the lowercase n, and its metric distance away from one liter or one gram becomes, dun, 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 and you may have guessed it, and you are correct, that's a billion. So that's 1 times 10 to the ninth, or 9 powers of 10, or 9 zeros, 9 decimal places to the right of 1. Hit pause again, and you can do that anytime you like to let this chart sink in a little bit and to maybe take out a piece of paper and scratch out a little bit of uh, numerals for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it, okay? So the metric distance numbers I'm giving you are away from the top, one liter or one gram. It's also important to note on this scale the distance between each of these units because in the lab we don't just think necessarily away from one liter of something. We might just think about milliliters and microliters. If you have an Eppendorf tube and it contains a small volume, let's say one milliliter, I have no real need necessarily to think about liters. I might want to know how many microliters are in that one milliliter in my Eppendorf tube. I might have a bigger flask of something, and that's what I'm thinking on the liter level. So remember, it just depends on the situation and what you actually use. Okay, scale accordingly. So between a liter and a milliliter, we've already done this one for you, you have 10 powers of 3. 
three powers of 10, excuse me, or 10 to the third. And between milli and micro, it's one times 10 to the third apart, or 1,000. So in other words, between milli and micro. So we can scale between these units as well. And so I want you to hit pause, and I want you to look at this chart, and you probably see where I'm going with this, but I want, I want you to, to write down for yourself how, what's the metric distance between micro and nano. And if you said that it was a factor of 1,000, or 1 times 10 to the third, you were right. Okay, So you can see how this all divides up. Importantly, you can think about these numbers going down the scale or up the scale. And that becomes very important. In other words, we have went down the scale, right? We wanted to know how many milliliters were in one liter. We wanted to know how many nanoliters were in one liter. But what if you wanted to go the other way? And you wanted to know how many liters were in one nanoliter. What if you wanted to know how many liters were in one microliter? We'd have to go the other way. We'd have to, instead of going from making the chart look bigger in number, we would have to make it go smaller. In other words, there's a lot of nanoliters in one liter. In fact, there's one times 10 to the ninth of them. But if you were talking about one nanoliter and you wanted to know how many liters were in that, well, that's going to be a really, really small number. In fact, it's going to be one times 10 to the ninth, but negative nine, okay? So let's go through a couple of examples and, and crystallize this a little bit for you, okay? So I'm going to ask you, what if I had one liter and I wanted to know how many nanoliters are in there, okay? We've done this one and it's on the chart, but I want you to write it out for yourself. So go ahead and pause it, crank up that Daft Punk again, okay? And write it down. How many nanoliters are in one liter? One liter equals, pause it. That's right. One liter equals one times 10 to the ninth nanoliters. And if I flip the script on you and I said, wait, that's great and all, but I want to know how many liters are in one single nanoliter. One nanoliter equals how many liters? First ask yourself, is that going to be a big number or a small number? It's going to be a really small number, right? If I only have a single nanoliter, and I already know that there's a lot of nanoliters in a liter, and if I have only one nanoliter, I don't have very many liters. So let's go pause it, write it down, do that little math for yourself to come up with this. One nanoliter equals one times 10 to the negative ninth liters if you move your decimal place from one to the left, nine spaces, you end up with zero point, and then that is eight zeros and one liter. Zero point zero 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 one. My dog just looked at me like, what are you doing? Why are you counting out so many zeros? Look how small that number is. This scaling up or down is so important in a lab. Lastly, the example becomes about that Eppendorf tube, okay? So the Eppendorf tube, go into that lab, you pick it up, small little piece of plastic, and you open up that cap, and you see one milliliter of a substance. Maybe it's distilled water. You have one milliliter. How many microliters are in that one milliliter? Okay, look at the chart. Ask yourself, are you going up or down? Ask yourself, how many powers of 10 am I moving? What's the metric distance? Is this going to come a smaller number or a bigger number than 1? Okay, so what we want to know is how many microliters do you find in 1 mil? 1 milliliter. Okay, go ahead and pause it and do that work. Welcome back. I hope you actually did that. And here is as you see the giveaway, 1 mil is equal to 1 times 10 to the third microliters. And you saw that little blue bar come up on the left. And that's just to remind yourself how much the scaling is between these units, okay? The distance between a mil 
and a microliter is 10 to the third, you just have to ask yourself, from which perspective am I looking? Am I asking how many mils are in a microliter, or vice versa? Hmm, what's that? Well, this is my little designation for tips. That's a little yellow tip you put on the end of a pipetter, and this is my opportunity to give you a little pro tip. See what I did there? A pro tip is a useful bit of information, and a tip is a tip, and there's a picture of the, well, okay, so you're telling me to move on, and so I will. Online conversion calculators, okay? In the lab, when you're not in a class, and maybe when you're in a class with a good instructor, you can pull out the old phone or the computer, consult Dr. Googs, meaning Google, or Dr. Googs as I like to call it, and type in convert milliliter to liter. And there will be some very handy dandy conversion calculators where you can enter the numbers you're working with and it'll spit out a result. I just don't want you to rely solely on them. It is really important to know how these scalings uh, take place in a lab setting, okay? That nano and liter distances, the milli and micro distances, these become very, very important when you're pipetting. And we're going to get into some more examples very shortly. Have you fallen in love all over again with the metric system? I know I have. In fact, honestly, I never fell out of love with it. I really wish we did everything in the metric system, including shoes. I mean, I get that a foot and a foot is the same, but you know, that's kind of arbitrary and, well, this isn't the place for that. So let's move forward, you metric system lovers, or at least tolerators and users of. How about that? Here we go. We're going to make molar solutions. We're going to get this buffer making party started right. We're going to just go back to the basics, a one molar solution, and uh, that might sound scary. It was for me when I first started in my lab. The first job I had, the first thing I was asked to do was make a one molar solution of sodium chloride, and I freaked out. And it went a little something like this, uh, hey son, we need you to make a one molar solution. That's my best impression of my boss, this was in Ohio, that's what it sounded like, and my response sounded like this, ah, oh, yes sir. Yeah, something like that. My voice was cracking and very angsty at the time. So that's my best rendition. And I freaked out. Did I mention that I had freaked out? So I returned to my knowledge of some basic chemistry principles and, again, those in the lab around me, uh, and I worked through it. So let's, let's do that for you right here. Okay? We're going to think about this in the context of a one molar solution, one capital M. And we're going to revisit some rules and what this all means, including molarity being moles per liter. And then we're going to scale from there. So we'll start with what makes a one molar solution, and then we'll think about what happens if you wanted a 0.1 molar solution, or a 1 millimolar solution, or you didn't want a liter of something, you wanted 500 mils of something, because you didn't need that much, or you, you didn't even have a vessel that big to contain all that liquid. We can scale from one molar. So that's how we're going to do it. When you start to think about the elements you need to make a molar solution, and yes, that was a heavy-handed pun. I Low-hanging fruit, I just had to do it. I'm sorry. But when you're gathering those elements that you need, the components, I guess, would be a better way to say it, of a molar solution, you're going to look at none other than the periodic table of elements for some information and for some guidance. And when I think of the periodic table, I think of the chemistry classes I had in my career and that it, there was always on the wall, on one side of the room, a periodic table of elements and it scared me and I thought I was going to have to memorize the whole thing, and I hope you didn't have to do that. I had to do parts of it, and that was really hard for me. Um, but we're not going to do that here. I'm showing you sodium, and the reason I'm doing that is for an important reason. 
when we're thinking about molarity, we need to look at the periodic table to get a number that's going to help us. And so what number is that? Well, you see two numbers here. You see 11 and you see 22.990, okay? It turns out that 11 is the atomic number of sodium and that 22.990 is the atomic mass. And the atomic mass is associated with units. And those units are grams per mole. Please, anytime you're doing math in the lab, units come first. You read a question on a quiz. You are asked to calculate molarity. Whatever it might be, think about the units first. What is the answer going to look like in terms of the units? Then you find the number that goes with it. Okay? Atomic mass is grams per mole. We're trying to get moles per liter. We already have some things that are working for us in our favor. So we need the atomic mass. And now that we have it, we have to use it. And to my knowledge, and in my experiences, weighing elements is much less common than weighing compounds containing combinations of elements. And one very, very common compound of elements is sodium chloride, as I just mentioned before. So you're going to find sodium in there, and you're going to find chloride in there, and sometimes it's going to arrive as a powder, as is the case here. And this gray container is a very commonly found item in labs, on shelves or in cabinets, things like that. And so I remember having to use a bottle that looked just like that, and that was the starting place. And I needed something off of that bottle. And I look at this bottle here, and I see some, some writing there, and it's kind of hard to read, but I see 500 grams, and that's the amount in a, in a full bottle. I, I, I see the lot number from the company. That, that's helpful in case I need to know uh, when it was made. And Oh, I even see that uh, this came from uh, Dubuque, Iowa. Nice. Kind of close to Ohio, but far from here. Those are both states. Iowa and Ohio are states. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, what I want is the molecular weight of sodium chloride. To make a molar solution, I need molecular weight. And what is that? Well, it's the additive amount of the atomic mass of sodium plus chloride, the two elements that we're talking about. So let's write that out. It looks like this. Sodium chloride, or NaCl, is the atomic mass of sodium at 22.99 grams per mole plus the atomic mass of chloride at 35.45 grams per mole. So go ahead and pause this video and to your favorite music, you know what mine is at this point, go ahead and add those two things together and let's get the molecular weight in grams per mole. Write down grams per mole first and then go ahead and add this together. You can do it by hand, you could punch it into a calculator on your phone or whatever device you're using. And you should come up with 58.44 grams per mole. Does that look good? Are we all on the same page? 58.44 grams per mole is the molecular weight of sodium chloride and an important component when we're thinking about making a one molar solution of sodium chloride. All right, excellent. Let's do the work of making a one molar sodium chloride buffer together. We're just going to do it together. And in fact, I'm going to be so generous as to show you, because I know I was a visual learner back in the day, and you might be too, I will show you what I looked like the first time, approximately, this picture is approximately at the same time I was first asked to do this at a job, and I look like that. And I'll just let you laugh all you want. Go ahead, I, it's fine. You gotta you got learn to laugh at yourself. And if you're noticing all those pimples and that greasy hair, uh, well, you know, that's what comes with working at McDonald's and eating fast food and just trying to pay your way through school, and your mom putting a bowl on your head and cutting around the bowl and calling that a hairstyle. She didn't really do that, but it kind of looks like I put a bowl on my head and, and cut around it. Anywho, I understand. This is not a simple 
matter here. And so make a one molar sodium chloride buffer. Who, me? Yes, let's do it together. So we already mentioned the importance of the molecular weight. Here we've put it down as 58.44 grams per one mole. And you can see why these units are really, really important. And you may remember back in your general chemistry class doing this long form where if you have one molar solution, you're looking for one mole per one liter. Moles will cancel out, leaving you with 58.44 grams of what you're looking for, in this case sodium chloride, 58.44 grams of sodium chloride, and then you'd add a solvent, um, potentially distilled water, or maybe it's um, a phosphate buffered solution of some sort. And you're gonna bring that up to volume in a total of one liter. So that's how you'd make a one molar solution at one liter. And because we like pictures, and because I mentioned my dog, I teased my dog, and I said he was the best dog, and his name was Mojo, and you were definitely wondering what he looked like, well, here he is. And you know, it's important that when doggies do something good, you give them a treat. And in this case, I'm gonna just show you my dog Mojo as an excuse to show you the best and most cutest dog in the world. And he's telling me, oh, you're a good boy and you get a treat. Good boy, make a solution. Okay, enough of that. Now that we've made our one molar solution, it's important to think about how we can demystify and make the math less scary by scaling from there. And we could do this in one of two ways. You could scale and move decimal places around and think about fractions of a total from one molar. Or you can always do it long form, just like you were taught in chemistry, where you would just, let's say you wanted that uh, um, one molar solution up there in a different volume, you, you change out those units and scale accordingly up there. Um, so we're going to do two examples together for scaling, okay? The first one is the instance where you don't want one molar sodium chloride, but your task is to go over to that shelf, grab that powdered sodium chloride off of the shelf, get your solvent, and create a 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride solution, okay? Not a one molar, but a 0 0.1 molar. And so if I saw that, I know I still need my molecular weight and, and we have that, but if I know that 58.44 grams up to one liter is one molar, well I can start to think how far away from one molar is 0 0.1. And so in my mind I think of this by, oh hey, look at that, uh, it looks like powers of 10. And it is. When you think about powers of 10 and moving decimal places, the math becomes less mathy, in fact, and more of a power of thinking about what it means. And that's the most important part. We can grab our calculators and they could do the work for us, but we really, really need to understand what we're putting into those calculators. Because if you don't know what buttons to press, you're not going to get that right answer. So however you think about it, just remember there's always more than one way to eat a Reese's. And I know that's another old reference to a Reese's peanut butter cu uh, cup commercial, but I am old as I told you. So if you look at the number 0 0.1 shown in orange and you compare that to one molar, well, that's a tenth. 0 0.1 is the same as 1 over 10, and 1 over 10 and 0 0.1 is the same as 1 times 10 to the negative 1. And 1 times 10 to the negative 1 from our discussion before should get you thinking about moving a decimal place to the right or to the left. That's right. Move it to the left, not right. So move it to the left. 1 times 10 to the negative 1, we are going for a smaller number. We would move it to the left of 1 and get 0 0.1. And you can see that all the way across. And so what this is really saying is a 0 0.1 molar NaCl solution, unless they've told you a different volume, and we haven't, is a tenth 
of the power, a tenth of the strength. And therefore, we're thinking about a tenth of the sodium chloride. So if we're keeping our volume the same, and you can look back up there at the top, we've got 58.44 grams up to one liter of volume for one molar, and we want a tenth. The only thing we're changing is the numerator up there. And we're thinking about moving the decimal place over to the left by one place. You come up with 5.844 grams up to the same volume. In other words, you're taking a tenth of that powder, you're going up to the same volume, and therefore it's a tenth as concentrated, and you, or I should say a tenth of the molarity, and so you have a 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride solution. If you want to do the long form, please do so now. Go right ahead. The second scaling is volume. So the first one was about the sodium chloride and how much of that we wanted to scale from. This one is about the volume. And of course you could scale both, but we'll just show you these two and then you could do some practices and we have those for you both on the online worksheets and in class. And so here we're going to keep it as a one molar sodium chloride solution, but we're going to cut the volume to 500 mils. We don't want a full liter. We don't even have a flask capable of holding a full liter. We just want to go up to volume of 500 mils. Mills, liters, mills, liters, mills, liters. Conversion between mills and liters, this sounds just like that handy dandy conversion chart through the metric system that we went over just a bit ago. And yes, it is, and let's put it to work for us. Let's do it, because the only thing that's changing here is that we want a different volume. We still want a one molar solution. Okay, so here's how I would think about it. 500 mils is the same as 1 times 10 to the negative third liters That pause was because I hope you caught that 1 times 10 to the negative 3 would have been the distance away if we were talking about 100 mLs, but here that would be 5 times 10 to the negative 3 liters as shown there, and that's equal to 0 0.5 liters. Move that decimal place over 3 from 500, 1 space, 2 space, 3 spaces, you get 0 0.5 liters. Fantastic. So we're thinking about half the volume, half the solvent. 500 mils is half of a liter. And so what we can do here then is return to our top one molar solution. We're still one molar. And if we've halved the amount of volume, we have to half the amount of powder that we grab to keep everything the same, to keep apples to apples if we half the volume, we need to half the amount of sodium chloride that we actually put in there. And so 58.44 divided by 2 is 29.22. So you'd want to take 29.22 grams, put it in your vessel of choice, and then add your solvent up to 500 mils. That would keep it one molar, where each of the amount of sodium chloride and the volume of solvent are halved from what you see up at the top. Let's go ahead and leave the molar universe for just a moment. Nobody wants to get sucked in to a molar vortex. Right? Bueller? Probably don't know that reference, but uh, I don't know, it's debatable. I think you should know that one. Um, we're going to turn our attention now to making percent solutions. And you can think about these as the weight of the compound over the volume of the solvent you're going to use to bring it up to the desired volume. So weight by volume, percent solutions, and we come into the lab and we greet our colleagues and we've had our coffee and our hands aren't too, too shaky, and we are asked to prepare 
a 100% solution of none other than sodium chloride again. Wow, labs really, really like the sodium chloride. Can't beat good old fashioned table salt, although in this case it's lab grade, but that's a different story. Um, and we're going to go ahead and scale from 100%. So, hey, hey, look at that. It's the same bottle. It's the same sodium chloride bottle that was on the shelf before. And you see the same information. It's still from the fantastic state of Iowa. Go Hawkeyes. But we are not interested anymore in knowing the molecular weight. In fact, when you're making a percent solution of anything, sodium chloride, sodium hydroxide, potassium chloride, the formula weight doesn't matter when you're making percent solutions. You just need to know what the percent you are making is and follow the following rules. And when I was actually in my first job, in that first lab, and I was asked to make a percent solution, of sodium chloride, this great big tall lanky Italian postdoc in the lab named Massimo Moreghi. Massimo, I mean, come on, you can't get more Italian than that. Massimo Moreghi, I'm not making this up. That was his name. And he came over to me and said, Crawford, you need to remember this and remember this for all times. And he scared me so bad, I dropped my lab notebook right on the floor, but it worked because I never forgot what he had said. And that was to make a 100% solution of anything, 100 grams in 100 mils is 100%. And boy, that stuck with me. And again, 100 grams of what you're measuring out up to volume, to a total of 100 mils. I don't care what it is, that delicious sodium chloride right there, don't eat it, or any other lab compound. 100 grams up to 100 mils, that's 100%. And you can see that the formula weight does not even come into the picture. So that's for 100% solutions. And sometimes you will make a 100% solution. But that's not always the case. There's a lot of other percents between 0 and 100 to make and to think about. And we make them all in the lab. And so let's scale from there, right? Let's, let's, let's not get old math involved here. Let's, let's scale instead. What if we wanted to make a 10% solution? OK, a 10% solution. If I scaled from 100, well, that's a tenth of 100. 100 divided by 10 is 10, a 10% 10 solution, a tenth of 100. Hmm. Well, you know what? If you keep the volume the same, up to 100 mils, then you need a tenth as much of whatever you're weighing out, in this case, sodium chloride. So we're going to make that 10 grams. Do you see how 100 divided by 10 is 10? And so 100% goes to 10%, and 100 grams goes to 10 grams. The volume remains the same. We're just having less of the compound, and therefore less percent solution. Fantastic. Go ahead and pause that and think about it if you really need to right here. This is an important concept. I hope you paused it, and I hope you're back, and I hope you understand. We can keep scaling from there by powers of 10, we're talking about moving decimal places. And because we're going from a bigger percent to a smaller one, we're moving that decimal place by a power of 10, one to the left. Let's do it again. Beyonce said something about to the left, to the left, something about everybody is to the left, to the left. I don't know. You might know that one better than I do. That's fine. So if we're going to go from 100% to 10% to 1%, Wow, ha, you are correct, my friends. Very good job. That's another division of 10. That's another move that decimal place one to the left, keep the total volume the same. We now have a 1% solution of one gram and up to volume to 100 mils. That's 1%, okay? That's a tenth away from 10%, and that's 100th away from 100%. One over 100 
times 100 is 1. You can keep going to your heart's content. What if we wanted 0.1 away from 1%? That's another tenth away. That's another movement of the decimal place, one to the left, a power of 10 less in what we're measuring out. We're going to keep that volume the same, and you guessed it, we've got 0 0.1 grams over 100 mils. And that's a thousandth, one over 1,000 times less than 100%. And one over 1,000 times less, you guessed it, is 1 times 10 to the negative 3 less than 100 in this case. Three decimal places to the left we go. And so those powers of 10, all the way back to that first slide of metric conversions on the simplified scale, really pays off yet again. And I hope you can see that. We'll do some more exercises online here and in class to power home. Let's do an example. I think that's always important. You're going to have examples to do on your own, but we'll do one together here. Let's do two changes, okay, from our rule of 100%. We're going to make it a 0.1% solution, and we're also going to make it 500 mils. Okay, so two things change, the percent and the volume. So let's go ahead and go up to our little handy dandy chart, and let's pull down from the top our rule for 0.1%. 0 0.1 grams up to 100 mils is 0.1%. That sounds good, except we need a different volume. We need 500 mils. So what we want to do is scale accordingly from here. If 0 0.1 grams up to 100 mils here is 0.1%, we're multiplying 100 by 5, in this case, to get 500 mils. And so accordingly, let's multiply our 0 0.1 grams by 5. And when we do that, we get 0 0.5 grams in 500 mils. So a 0.1% solution of sodium chloride in 500 mils is 0 0.5 grams and up to volume in 500 mils. So let's go ahead and wipe the board. Magic. The math is gone. And let's say that fantastic Italian postdoc who wears a suit and tie every time he goes to see the doctor. True story. Today in the lab, he wants you to make that same 0.1% sodium chloride solution. He wants the total volume to still be 500 mils. And he says, there's another way to get to that same result. And you freak out, but he wants you to take comfort in that. And the lesson here is that there are more than one way to get to the same answer. And so whichever logically makes sense to you is the way to go. Some people may like how I did it on the previous slide, some people might like this one better, and some people might find a third way to do it, and you're all right as long as we get to the same answer. We all have fancy calculators, we can pull them out of our pocket, open up the phone app, and punch into the calculator and get the same answer. But if you don't know what to put into that calculator, that's the issue. And so let's make this less about math and more about logic, and let's all get to this in the way that makes the most sense to us. So on the previous slide, I thought to myself, okay, if I've got my rules of thumb up there at the top from 100% to 0.1%, and the game has changed where I have to consider a 0.1% solution and a different volume, I could change one or the other first. And as you see, we went for the 0.1%, we considered that as the situation first, and considered the volume later. On this example, we're going to take the same solution and consider the volume first and go for the percent later. So let's see how that works. Here, um, we're going to copy paste below a rule for 100%. We're going to think to ourselves, we remember very strongly that 100 grams and up to 100 mils is 100% and we can't forget that. So we're going to just copy paste that down. But we're going to know that our volume changed by a factor of 5 times our rule. You can see there, we went from 100 mils to 500 mils in the denominator, and therefore we go from 100 grams to 500 grams. We're going to scale accordingly. Multiply the bottom by 5, multiply the top by 5. That is a 100% solution in 500 mils. 
but we're not interested in a 100% solution in 500 mils. We're interested in a 0.1% solution. And so what we have to do is now treat the uh, problem of our percentage. So how do we do that? Well, let's carry over that 500 grams. We're only interested in how much of that sodium chloride in that bottle over there do I need to weigh out. So we'll carry that over, and we're going to multiply it by a factor that changes our 100% into a fraction for 0.1%. So that's why you see 0.1 over 100. Those percent signs are going to cancel out, leaving you with grams, and that'll tell you how much to weigh on your scale. Back to the powers of 10 we go. 0.1 over 100. You can reach for your calculator, and that's cool. And it's going to give you the same answer as what I'm going to tell you right here. If you're going to go 0.1 over 100, you're dividing by a bigger number, your decimal point is going to move to the right or to the left. If you said left, you're correct. We're making a smaller number. 0.1 is going to become an even smaller number. How many decimal places do we have to move it? How many zeros are down there? Two powers of 10. Two zeros. 100. So let's move it two places to the left. If you divided 0.1 by 100, you're going to get 0 0.001. And so essentially, this is 0 0.001 times 500, which turns out to be 0.5 grams. That's 0.5 grams. We're going to carry over our 500 mils from beginning, because that's going to be the total volume. As you see here, 0.5 grams in 500 mils, just like on the last slide, is going to give us a 0.1% solution. A third way to have thought about this is going from the 500 grams and dealing with the percent as moving the decimal point right away. You could have thought to yourself, 0.1 percent converted as a fraction of 100% is 0 0.001, like we said, that would be like taking 1 and moving the decimal place 3 to the left. We just divided by 100 and moved it 2 from 0 0.1, but if we started from 1, that would be 3 to the left. Similarly, you could take your 500 grams and move the decimal place 3 to the left, and you're going to get 0.5 grams. So no matter how you slice it, you're going to end up in that right spot. So there's three ways to think about it, and whichever makes the most sense is the way you should go for it. So in summary, so far, we've made one molar solution, and we've made a 100% solution of sodium chloride. Bravo. That's going to keep your boss and your coworkers happy for a little bit. When we move forward, you're going to put these to work. So bravo. Take a break for a moment. Pat yourself on the back. This is a win. You have to celebrate those wins, and we'll keep moving forward here in just a moment. OK, so welcome back. Let's say you're at that job, and your morning tasks were to do what we just did, create molar and percent solutions, make those great stock buffers. And then that postdoc said, hey, go take it to lunch. And you were like, cool, but I don't want Italian food today. I want Chipotle. So you go have your Chipotle lunch, and you're fighting the stomach grumbles now, and we're in the afternoon portion of the day, and the task at hand is to take those stock buffers and make working solutions by performing dilutions. So here we go, labeled section called diluting stock buffers to make working solutions. And yes, there's some rhyming words in there, and uh, I'll spare you the uh, pain of listening to me say that. And, we're just going to go right away to a talking point here. When we go from a stock uh, buffer to a working solution, generally speaking, one of the important points is that we're working from higher concentration to lower concentration. And so concentration is key. The stocks are at a higher concentration, but when we use them in experiments, they're going to be at diluted amounts and therefore lower concentrations. Let's take a quick pictorial overview of how that might work. Hey, look at that, voila! It's the sodium chloride we've seen before. You went over to one part of the lab, and you went to that chemical shelf, and you grabbed the sodium chloride. 
and you created a stock buffer that we're going to keep on the shelf at high concentration, maybe in a vessel that looks like that. You're going to store this in the lab away from the chemicals, maybe at a spot close to your bench. And I really like these one liter, and you can see there one liter equals 1,000 mils by looking at the bottle. I really like these ones with the orange cap. Orange is a great color, it's a happy color. But you also have the benefit of having that nice tight seal by the screw cap. This has nothing to do with the discussion other than I like lab equipment and it's fun to pick ones you like the best. And so there's one of my favorites, so there. But what we want to do now, we're going to think about going to this new vessel, this new working solution. And this arrow here that I just put in is going to indicate that we want to reduce the concentration of our stock. So we're going from this awesome orange capped little vessel to potentially something smaller, something you're going to work with during an experiment. And it could be as small as an Eppendorf tube. And so let's say this Eppendorf tube might have a one mil volume. You just need a small amount. You need to reduce that concentration of your stock. And it could look like a 1.5 mil Epinorph tube. Here's another pro tip, and you might see that I strategically placed the tip as if this floating magical tip was pipetting something into that awesome Epinorph tube, and I did that on purpose for your enjoyment. There's a few reasons why uh, we do this uh, in the way that we're describing, meaning making a stock and then at your bench working from a smaller volume in a test tube, going from the bottle uh, to the Eppendorf tube. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of things to think about. One is you could imagine that if you needed a very, very, very small amount, a very small concentration of sodium chloride, to try to measure it out in a small volume to accommodate one mil might be super difficult. We might be talking about unmeasurable quantities, way lower than the milligram amount. And so since we don't have balances that sensitive and that would not be accurate at all, even if we could, we go for accuracy and precision sake from making higher concentrations using amounts that we can measure easily with the equipment that we have to then dilutions of it to smaller amounts. So there's one reason. You don't need a high concentration. Another reason is that sometimes when you're doing a dilution, you're moving from one solvent to another. Sometimes compounds that you're creating stock buffers from require a solvent such as ethanol. And you only want the component of ethanol in your working solution to be small, maybe a hundredth of the total volume. So just small microliter amounts because you don't want the ethanol to have any negative effects on anything else in your experiment. This can be important, say, if you're doing microbiology and you want to expose bacteria to a compound that you've made a stock buffer from, but you don't want to expose it to too much ethanol. Um, luckily, in experiments, we design controls for that. So if you had situation A, where you made a working solution in an Eppendorf tube of a buffer at a low concentration of a compound, you'd create a buffer control to go with it. So you'd just do the ethanol without whatever you made the compound using. We'll talk about that in class, but for now, let me show you actually how we do this. Let's do some math together and let's make some dilutions. Now that we have the overview, let's put our knowledge to work. Work, 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 work. You can work from home. Oh, oh. I don't know how to delete that. I'll just leave it in there. And if you're laughing, thanks. And if you're laughing harder at what I just put up on the screen, or if you don't know what it is, you're going to laugh when I tell you that's my drawing of a mouse. And in class, what? It doesn't look like a mouse? It looks like a hunchback? I'm telling you, look, the tail's on the left, the ear's colored in black, there's a three whisker theme going on up at the front. That's a mouse. <laughs> 
Okay, I don't blame you for laughing. It's the best I could do. So, there. Now, in class, our activity is going to be about comparing data for bacteria that are going to come out of a potential animal experiment where two different mice sets are treated with either a compound called X or a compound called Y. And so let's get kind of familiar with thinking about that and let's make our treatments, okay? So here we go. Compound X. Uh, it could be anything. It could be an antibiotic or whatever it might be that we're wondering about its effect on bacteria in the mouse. It's not important right now. But what I do know is that compound X is going to be stored in the lab as a stock buffer at high concentration. Cool. Just like everything else we were talking about. Hey, look at there. It happens to be kept at a 100% solution. It might be kept in an Eppendorf tube. I know, we said orange flasks, but not all stock buffers are kept in those. Sometimes they're in small containers. And since compound X is orange, there it is. Molecules of compound X, a 100% stock. But you know what? This is about comparing an experiment in the lab class portion where X and Y are evaluated in different mice. So here comes mouse number two. I rotate it horizontal. They're facing off here. It's another cute mousey or whatever you think it looks like. And here is then compound Y. And here's a little new wrinkle into how we can make uh, stock buffers, and that is called X. So, meaning 250 times what we would want to use in a working solution. All of our working solutions, unless otherwise designated, are desired to be at 1X. So this is 250 times the amount of compound Y that we actually want to put into the mouse. So here's our Eppendorf tube in the lab containing compound Y at 250 times what it needs to be. Now, the goal then would be to put a diluted amount into the mouse. Okay, We don't want to put 100% of compound X in there. It's going to kill that poor little animal right away. And so we have to make a dilution in the lab. Hey, look at that, less molecules. And then we'll add it to the mouse. Similarly, we have to do a dilution of compound Y, and then we add it to the mouse. We already went over why we keep uh, all these compounds and stocks at higher concentration. This is another example of them, a treatment for an animal that needs to be diluted first. Okay? I hope you're with me so far. This setup is a pictorial representation of what we're going to talk about in the lab. Okay, so the question becomes, how do we do this? Let's, let's do a little math. How do we go from a stock buffer to a working solution? I'm going to give you a formula. We're going to do it the long way, and then we're going to do it a little short way, and you can see which you prefer. Either way will get you to the same end point. So whichever one makes more sense to you is the one I'd like you to use. So uh, here we go. We've got C1 times V1. Ooh. You might know where I'm heading, equals dun, 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 C2 times V2. So in this case, the C is concentration, and the V is volume. So let's look at the left side of that equation. Concentration 1, volume 1. That is an entire reference to what's in that Eppendorf tube in the lab. That's the stock buffer at 100% or 250 times, depending on which one you're talking about. Okay, What we really, really, really want to know then is how much do we need to take? How much of that do we really need to take out of there of the 100% solution or the 250x? That's all the C1 and V1 referring to that. The C2 and V2, well that's where we want to go. That's that working solution that we need to make before we put it into the mouse. Concentration 2, volume 2. That's reference to working solutions. So let's do an example for compound X. All right? So the only number I see is 100%. That's the only thing I know. Before I do go any further, which value of those four in this little equation 
is represented by 100%. Where should that go? If you said C1, concentration 1, the concentration of the stock buffer, you got it. Nice work. Work, 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 work. I need some more information. I need some more numbers. Okay? So, in the lab, you might be given the following piece of information. Here's an example. That postdoc might say, you know what? We actually want to create a 15% working solution. A 15% working solution. 100% is too much to give the animal, but 15% should do the trick. This is the effect we want to look for. And we want to make a small volume. We want to make one and a half mils, 1.5 mils. And we're going to put that in um, a uh, solvent called PBS or phosphate buffered saline for short phosphate buffered saline so what this is saying is go over to that freezer in the lab take out the hundred percent you've got this Eppendorf tube in your hand and over here in your other hand you have a new Eppendorf tube and you have to make one and a half mils of compound X at 15 percent these two pieces of numbers I just threw at you, 15% and 1.5 mils, are the working solution side of the equation. One of those is C2 and one of those is V2. And if you said that 15% was concentration 2 and 1.5 mils was V2, well, you'd nailed it. So let's put this all together, okay? In this case, we have the mystery brackets, okay? Look at that. Let's, let's go to work. So we already said where things go, let's put it down. The stock buffer is represented by C1 and V1. We know we have a stock of 100%. The V1, that's what we're solving for, that's X. That's what we don't know. How much, how much are we going to put into our pipette? How much are we going to take of that 100% to make our dilution? This is where we're heading. We know we want it to be 15% and we know we want the volume to be 1.5 mils. Before I go any further, let me ask you a question. Does the volume of the stock buffer matter? No, it doesn't. That could be in a mil or 10 mils or 100 mils. It's still 100%. The concentration stays the same regardless of what that volume is. The only time this would matter is if after we solved this V1, and we got an amount to pipette that we didn't have enough in that Eppendorf tube. So let's say you came up with, oh, we need a mil, but in that tube we only have 500 microliters. We have half of as much as we need. Now you're in trouble and you have to go make more. That's the only time that would matter. It doesn't factor into this math, okay? The volume of compound X at your stock is irrelevant, okay? So here we go. Um, as you see here, you're going to multiply 15% by 1.5 mils, and you're going to divide by 100%, and look at your units. You might have already written those down, just like I said before, when you're solving. Write down the units first. You're looking for a volume. We've got everything in mils, and so, boom, 15% times 1.5 mils divided by 100% is, quick little calculator here, ba ba da ba 0.225 mils. 15 times 1.5 equals whatever divided by 100 equals 0.225 mils. I don't know a lab instrument that I can accurately measure 0.225 mils in, but I do know that if I get a pipette and I convert this to microliters, then I can do that. I can go grab a certain amount here represented by this number in microliters. So let's go all the way back and let's double duty here. We've diluted, that's cool, but let's also convert. So how many microliters is represented by this? 0.225 mils, that's the question. Okay, go ahead and solve that. Pause it right here. Welcome back, and if you said, I need to move that decimal place three to the right, because there's going to be more microliters in here, 0.225 mils is equal to 225 microliters, moving it by a power of 10 to the third, three decimal points, three powers of 10. 
well, then you nailed it. So I do have an instrument, a micropipetter, that I can use to grab 225 microliters accurately. And so what we would do is then grab 225 microliters, okay, and then you subtract that from the total volume of 1.5 mils, and the rest of that is your solvent to get 225 microliters representing a 15% solution. And I hope that all made sense. So this is the long form, C1V1 equals C2V2. What do I have? Where am I going? I'm solving for the volume I need to take out of my concentrated stock. So really good job on that. I hope that made sense, and I hope you're excited to then do the next logical step, which would be to repeat this process for compound Y. 250x, hey, that's 250 times too high. 250 times what we want, that's a concentration. So the concentration here is 250x. So you're already thinking to yourself, excellent, I know the C1. I just need to know how much of that thing do I need to pipette. It's 250 times what it needs to be. That's a lot. That's really concentrated. I'm already thinking to myself, logically, the answer to this question might be a small number. To go from 250x to my working solution, I, don't, I might not need that much, right? If it's, if it's very, very concentrated right now, and I, and I don't need it to be very concentrated, and I'm using small volumes, then I'm not going to be pipetting very much. So let's, let's show you that. The idea here is to create a 1x working solution, and we'll keep the volume the same for our total volume of the a working solution of 1.5 mils, and the solvent again is phosphate buffered saline, or PBS, very commonly used in labs. I'm going to bring down my parenthesis as I did before, and as you may have um, uh, heard me just say, and, and we're waiting to write in there anxiously, and I hope you're doing this with me, um, C1 of my stock, what I have is 250x. And again, I need to solve for V1. I need to know how much do I have to retrieve from that tube in the lab containing a high concentration of compound Y. What am I pipetting here? Now we got to make a working solution before we put it in that mouse. <laughs> we can't do 250x, come on, that's, that's crazy talk. Crazy! Mm -mm. So we're trying to go to 1x like it says, that's our C2. And we want our total volume of our working solution to be 1.5 mils. I'm looking across, all my units are the same. Those x's are going to cancel out just like the percentages did in the last slide. And I'm solving for V1, what are my units going to be? If you said mils, you're absolutely right. We're going to get a result in mils, which makes sense. We're looking for a volume. How much am I taking volumetrically? So if we do what we did before, multiply and divide, we have 1x times 1.5 mils divided by 250x, which really is 1 times 1.5, which is 1.5, divided by 250. And 1.5 divided by 250 is 0 0.006 bring our units down, we have mils. Once again, that's not a pipettable amount using instruments that I know how to use, and I gotta convert that to something I do know how to use, and that would be a micro pipetter, and we gotta think microliters. So let's again convert mils to microliters. Go ahead, pause it, work it out. Hey, all right, good job. You probably were thinking, when is he gonna come back? I can't wait to hear the answer. Well, the answer is six microliters, three decimal places, to the right, another conversion using the power of 10 to the third, or three powers of 10. So excellent job. Compound Y, C1, V1 equals C2, V2. This is the long way. You can use it to your heart's content. Now what I'm going to show you is a quicker way, and whichever way you prefer, whichever way is more intuitive, that's the one I want you to use. I mentioned a shortcut alternative to get to the same solution. And as promised, here it is. So let's stick with compound Y. We kind of went through the longer way, the C1, V1 equals C2, V2. Let's go through a bit of a shortcut. And essentially, 
I'm going to get to a different way of determining V1, which is what we wanted in the first place. So, in this case, I'm going to think about this whole exercise of making a dilution just like making a dilution. And so, for this, I need a dilution factor, okay? The way to use dilution factors to determine V1 is by the following formula, where volume 1 equals the dilution factor, so basically the stock buffer to working solution dilution, times the V2. What's the total volume that you want to make your working solution at? Okay, so dilution factor times V2. So what in this instance for compound Y is our dilution factor? Well, to determine that, we want to know where we're at and where we're going. And this is the elements of C1 and C2. And they're going to end up in the same spots they were before. It's the same principle, just written a little differently. And so whichever one of these is more intuitive to you, that's one you should use. So the dilution factor here is equal to 1 over 250. 1 over 250, a 250th of the stock buffer. So in other words, we've got our C2, where we want to go, which is 1, over where we started, our C1, which is 250. That's our dilution factor. And if you go to the slide before, you see that eventually your equation, when you did the C1 V1 equals C2 V2, had those numbers exactly as shown here where 1 is in the numerator and 250 is in the denominator. So let's put this to work. Let's solve for V1, okay? So as stated here, it's the dilution factor times the V2. And so we've got our dilution factor all ready to go. And then we multiply this by our 1.5 mils. So 1 divided by 250 times 1.5 mils is, as you may have suspected, the same 0 0.006 mils as the slide before, going about it just a slightly different way in your mind of thinking about it, using the same numbers and the same principles to get to the same answer, and therefore, upon conversion, the same six microliters. There you go. Two ways to get to the same answer. Whichever is more straightforward to you is the way you should use. If you have a third way that I haven't used here, that's all good too. Okay? So thanks very, very much for your attention and your focus throughout this and for excusing the crudity of my drawings of a mouse. Um, not well done, I know. Um, but I made up for it with the cute pictures of my dog. So there. What I want you to do now is go over to the first problem set and work through those. Um, they go exactly in line with this video set. So thanks a lot and we'll see you soon.